will now look at the provisions of TDS, TCS and advance tax. These are basically called prepaid taxes. So TDS stands for tax deduction at source or deduction of tax at source. Tax is deducted at source. By whom? By the payer. On behalf of the payee. That means the SSE. In case of specified payments. Next is TCS which refers to collection of tax at source or tax collection at source. Tax is collected at source. By whom? By the seller. On behalf of whom? The buyer, that is the SSE, in the case of specified transactions. And third is, third is advance tax, where tax is paid in advance by the SSE. So these are called prepaid taxes and therefore the credit of prepaid taxes is given to the SSE while determining his final tax liability. Right. So the final tax liability is 1 lakh and the prepaid taxes are 60,000. The final tax payable would be 40,000. Now we will first look at TDS, then we will look at TCS and finally advance tax. So first we look at the salary payments. Section 192. This covers salary. We will look at the section who should be the payer payee. What is the specified payment liable to TDS and time and rate of TDS and some other points. The payer should be any person responsible for paying income chargeable under the head salaries that is the employer and the payee should be the employee. A specified payment is the income chargeable under the head salaries. TDS is to be deducted at the time of payment. What is the rate? The rate is the average rate of tax computed on the basis of what rate? Rates in force for the financial year in which the payment is made. On what income? On the estimated income of the SSE under the head salaries for that financial year. So we determine the income, then we determine the tax on this income. Tax divided by income is equal to average rate of tax and we apply this average rate of tax to the income to determine the amount of TDS that is supposed to be directed. Therefore, in effect, what this means is TDS is to be directed under 192 as per the slab rates plus applicable surcharge in HEC. And without PAN cases, a higher rate of TDS applies and this is something that is applicable for many of the provisions and we will uh, consider this in detail after we have discussed the various provisions of TDS. TDS is not deductible where no tax is payable, this is but obvious. That is where income is not more than the basic exemption limit. What are the steps for computation of TDS? We will first look at those steps. To simplify the whole process, I have listed down the steps for computing TDS under section 192. So we start with the estimated income of the SSE under the head salaries. Okay, That which is estimated for the financial year. To this, we add income chargeable under any other head for the same financial year okay if the details are furnished by the employee in that respect the additional income can also be added for the purpose of computing tds we deduct loss we deduct loss but loss only under one head that is under the head income from house property that too up to a limit which is up to rupees 2 lakh for the same financial year provided details are furnished by the sse Except for this loss, any other loss is not supposed to be deducted in computing the amount of TDS. We also add income under the head salaries if it is from the other employees as well. Right In a case where there are multiple employers during the financial year, if details are furnished by the employee. That brings us to the amount of gross total income from which we allow deductions under chapter BIA. And this brings us to the amount of total income for the purpose of TDS. We compute tax on the total income at the applicable slab rates. We allow rebate under section 87A. We add surcharge as applicable and 4% health and education says. Now while computing tax, we need to know that under section 115 BAC, concessional rates of tax apply, right? Now whether we need to apply, whether the employer needs to apply those concessional rates in computing the amount of TDS. In a case where employer is not having income under the head PGBP, okay. Now in this connection, recollect our discussion uh, on this topic short while ago, where the employee is not having <coughs> income under the head PGBP, tax will be computed by the employer under section 115 BAC at those concessional rates. 
when where the employee intimates the employer of his intention to opt for 115 BAC for that previous year because as we know in such case the option can be exercised every year else tax will be computed as per the regular provisions but what if the employee is having income under the head PGBP we already noted in our discussion on 115 BAC that the option once exercised for a previous year cannot generally be changed subsequently it applies to subsequent years as well therefore the intimation to the employer for subsequent previous years must not deviate from the option which has been once exercised in a previous year as per this approach the employer needs to apply the rate of tax and ultimately determine the tax on the total income from this we need to reduce the relief under section 891 based on the details furnished by the employee but this uh, deduction is allowed only where only where the SSE is either a government servant or an employee in a company, cooperative society, local authority, university, institution, association or body not in any other case we, are, we also allow deduction of TDS which has been deducted on salary from the other employers or on the other income that we added above right so those incomes from other employer or the additional incomes apart from salary which we added there would have been TDS which would have been deducted so that also needs to be reduced so what is the balance the balance then is the amount of TDS that needs to be deducted under section 192 and how we deduct we deduct it on monthly basis that is at the time of payment of salary and the amount to be deducted is the amount of TDS to be deducted which is this right based on the total income that we computed divided by the months for which the employee is employed during the financial year there may be any previous excess or deficiency which can arise right because the estimate may undergo a change in such case the adjustment can be made by increasing or reducing the amount of TDS subsequently uh, during the same financial year tax on non-monetary perquisite under section 192-1a now the employer may provide non-monetary perquisites to the employee and tax will be payable on such perquisites as well non-monetary perquisites employer has an option to pay the tax on these perquisites provided to the employee there is an option that the employer can pay tax on behalf of the employee we noted in the topic on salary that such tax is exempt as perquisite in the hands of the employee specifically under section 1010 cc we also noted in the topic on pgbp that employer is not allowed the deduction in computing pgbp income on account of such tax that the employer pays right so the employer has an option to pay such tax and he can pay such tax himself without the need to deduct it as tds from the salary and what is the rate at which uh, this tax need to be paid it is to be determined it is the tax payable is determined at the average of tax computed on the basis of rates in force for the financial year on the income chargeable under the head salaries including the income by way of such non-monetary perquisites so we compute the income including this income by way of non-monetary perquisites then we determine the amount of tax on such income right and we divide tax by the income so tax divided by such income it gives us the average rate of tax average rate of tax right now this income will have two components one is the non-monetary perquisite and the other is the balance salary so we apply average rate of tax to this non-monetary perquisite which gives us the amount of tax to uh, be paid by the employer under section 192 1a which is the tax on non-monetary perquisites and then we apply average rate of tax to the balance of salary which gives us the amount of TDS to be deducted from the salary under section 192 while paying the salary that tax need, needs to be deducted now such tax which is paid by the employer on non-monetary perquisites is treated as tax paid on behalf of the employee what is the consequence the consequence is that the employee the employee can take credit of such tax you know against his final tax liability even though tax has not been deducted at source because it has been paid by the employer it has not been deducted at source from the salary even then the employee can take the credit of such tax now we noted above that the TDS is to be deducted at the time of payment but there is an exception in the case of ESOP in such case the time of deducting TDS is deferred in respect of what perquisite on account of employee stock option ESOP provided by not everyone but by an eligible startup 
In such case, TDS can be detected within 14 days of the earliest of 1, 2 or 3. One is after the expiry of 48 months from the end of the relevant assessment year. Two, from the date of the sale of such specified security or sweat equity share by the SSE. Three, from the date of the SSE ceasing to be the employee of the person. One or two or three, whichever is earliest. And what is the rate at which the TDS will be deducted? TDS which is in force in the financial year when it is deducted, that means a later financial year, or the financial year in which the perquisite arises, that is uh, the year in which there is allotment or transfer of the security or share. So it is provided that the TDS will be deducted on the basis of rates for the financial year in which the specified security or sweat equity share was allotted or transferred, not the financial year in which TDS is deducted. This is section 192. Now we come to section 192A which covers EPF employee provident fund. The payer is the trustees of EPF and the payee is the employee and what is paid is the accumulated balance in the recognized provident fund which is not exempt or recollect the topic on salaries where we noted that if certain conditions are fulfilled, accumulated balance which is uh, payable is not taxable. If those conditions are not satisfied, it is taxable, it is not exempt. When it is not exempt, TDS needs to be deducted at the time of payment at the rate of 10%. But in without PAN cases, the TDS is to be deducted at the rate of maximum marginal rate, which is at the rate of 42.744%. TDS is not deductible where the payment or the aggregate of such payments is less than rupees 50,000. Otherwise, TDS needs to be deducted. We now move to the theme in respect of TDS on interest, dividend and investment income. First, we look at section 193, which deals with interest on securities. What is the meaning of interest on securities? Recollect our discussion in the topic of interest on under the head IFOS. And we noted there that interest on securities means 1. Interest on government security. 2. Interest on debentures or other securities issued by whom? By a local authority or company or statutory corporation. So basically interest on government security, interest on debenture of a company. These are examples of interest on securities. Now for 193 TDS, the payer can be any person, but the payee should be a resident. And specified payment is what? Interest on securities. TDS is to be deducted at the earlier of credit or payment at the rate of 10% and there is a higher rate for without PAN or ROI non-filer cases. TDS is not deductible in the following six cases. <clears throat> From interest payable on the following. 1. On national development bonds. 2. On any security of the government, central or state. 3. On 8% savings taxable bonds 2003 or 7.75% savings taxable bonds 2018. Provided interest for the financial year is not more than 10,000. This is the limit. Fourth, interest on debenture issued by a company which is not a closely held company. In other words, which is a widely held company or which is a company in which the public are substantially interested. If three conditions are satisfied. A. Interest is payable to an individual or HUF. B. Interest paid or likely to be paid during the financial year is not more than 5000 and C. Interest is paid by an account payee check. In that case, interest need not be deducted under 193. Fifth, interest on security issued by a company in dematerialized form, DMAT form and which is listed on a recognized stock exchange in India. And lastly, interest on 6% gold bonds 1977 or 7% gold bonds 1980 held by whom? Held by an individual. If the total nominal value of such bonds in either case that means 6% uh, gold bonds or 7% gold bonds in either case is not more than 10,000 at what time? At any time during the period to which the interest relates. Next is section 194A which deals with other interest that is interest which is other than interest on securities which we cover under 193 above. The payer should be any person not being an individual or HUF or a specified individual or HUF. So if it is not an individual or HUF, it can be any person. But if it is individual or HUF, the pair, then the individual or HUF should be specified. The concept of specified individual or HUF is applicable to certain other provisions as well. So it will be good if at this stage we look at this concept. Who is an specified individual or HUF? It is an individual or HUF whose total sales 
gross receipts or turnover from the business or profession carried on by him is more than rupees 1 crore in case of business or more than rupees 50 lakh in case of profession during which year during the immediately preceding financial year if this condition is satisfied then the individual or huf is called a specified individual or huf right so section 194a applies where the payer is an specified individual or huf or in case of any other person <clears throat> the pay should be a resident the specified payment is what interest which is other than interest on securities interest on securities is covered under section 193 tds is to be deducted at the time of earlier of credit or payment at the rate of 10 percent and there is a higher rate for without pan or roi non-filer cases tds is not deductible in the following cases number one where interest credited or paid during the financial year does not exceed the following and there is a limit if the interest exceeds then tds is supposed to be deducted otherwise not and it depends on the payer and the payee where the payer is bank or a cooperative bank or post office the limit is 50000 for a senior citizen for others it is 40000 in the case of other payers the limit for both senior citizen and others is 5000 now the question is who is a senior citizen senior citizen is an individual who is resident in india of the age of 60 years or more at any time during the relevant previous year so only if interest for the financial year created or paid exceeds this limit then tds needs to be deducted and now a bank or a cooperative bank will have multiple branches now how is this limit to be computed if interest is uh, if interest is arising from multiple branches so the above limit is to be determined per branch per branch however if the payer has adopted core banking solution cbs which is the which is the uh, uh, the position in most of the cases these days then this limit is per payer that means per bank or per cooperative bank in other words uh, the interest for all the branches for that bank is to be consolidated to check whether this limit is exceeding or not where the payer has adopted cbs else the limit is per branch number two tds is not deductible on interest credited or paid by a firm to its partner three interest credited or paid by the central government under the income tax act four interest on zero coupon bond fifth interest on deposits not being time deposits with a bank which means in other words deposits in savings account so interest on savings bank account interest on post office time deposit or post office recurring deposit post office monthly income account kisan vikas patra indira vikas patra national savings certificates eighth issue seventh interest which is credited or paid by a cooperative society and this doesn't include a cooperative bank because cooperative bank is what we have noted some time back so interest credited or paid by a cooperative society <coughs> to its member okay tds is not supposed to be deducted or interest on deposits which is other than time deposits but still the cooperative society is liable to deduct tds if its total sales gross receipts or turnover is more than rupees 50 crore in which year in the immediately preceding financial year and the interest which is credited or paid during the financial year current financial year is more than 40,000 this limit is 50,000 for a senior citizen payee number eight interest credited or paid to a bank okay so you take a loan and you pay interest to a bank tds will not apply interest credited or paid to a bank or cooperative bank financial corporation life insurance corporation unit trust of india or a company or a cooperative society carrying on insurance business ninth interest which is credited on the compensation amount awarded by the motor accidents claims tribunal 10 if such interest is not credited but it is paid the interest paid on such compensation where the interest paid during the financial year is not more than 50000 if it is more than 50000 tds needs to be deducted <clears throat> next is section 194 which covers dividend the payer should be a domestic company not a foreign company the payee should be a resident 
amount which is covered is dividend. TDS is to be deducted before payment or distribution at the rate of 10% and a higher rate applies for without PAN or ROI non-filer case. <clears throat> TDS is not deductible where dividend is paid to an individual shareholder by any mode other than cash if dividend distributed or paid during the financial year is not more than 5000 so if the shareholder is individual shareholder dividend is not in cash dividend the payment is not in cash and the amount during the financial year is not more than 5000 then tds is not supposed to be deducted now recollect the definition of dividend the meaning as we discussed in the topic on ifos all payments which are treated as dividend under section 222 which we discussed there are covered under section 194. Next is section 194k income from units. The payer should be mutual fund or unit trust of India and the payee should be a resident and specified payment is what income in respect of units. TDS is deducted at the time of earlier of credit or payment at the rate of 10% and higher rate applies for without PAN or ROI non-filer cases. TDS is not deductible in two cases. One where the income credited or paid during the financial year is not more than 5000 or if the income is in the nature of capital gains. For example, capital gains will arise when? In case of transfer of units. TDS will not apply. Next is section 194DA, life insurance policy proceeds. <clears throat> payer can be any person but the payee should be a resident. So any sum under a life insurance policy, this includes bonus which is not exempt under section 1010D is covered under 194DA. Recollect our discussion in the topic on exempt incomes where uh, life insurance proceeds are exempt under 1010D but where it is not exempt then TDS needs to be deducted at the time of payment at the rate of 5% and higher rate applies for without PAN or ROI non-filer cases. TDS is not deductible in the following two cases. One where the payment during the financial year is less than 1 lakh or on the sum that is exempt under 1010D. <coughs> Now we should note that while the threshold for the trigger of TDS provision is 1 lakh but TDS is not necessarily deductible on this amount. The rate of 5% is applied on the amount of income which is comprised in the payment and which will be what? Some received minus the premium paid. So premium paid will need to be deducted and on the balance 5% will be applied. But some received is to be considered with respect to the threshold of 1 lakh to see whether 194 DA is applying or not. Next is section 194EE, this applies in the case of national savings scheme where the payer is the post office and payee can be any person and this covers amount which is withdrawn from the national savings scheme 1987 but in respect of which a deduction has been allowed under ATCCA together with interest accrued on such amount. Then TDS is to be deducted at the time of payment at the rate of 10% and higher rate applies for without PAN or ROI non-filer cases. TDS is not deductible in two situations. One, where the payment during the year is less than 2500 and two, where the payment is made to the hires of the SSE. That means in the case of his death. We now move to casual incomes. 194B and 194BB are relevant and both relate to winnings. But 194BB is in respect of winnings from horse race. For others, 194B is relevant. So 194B first. The payer and the payee can be any person. A specified payment is winnings from any lottery, crossword puzzle, card game and other game of any sort. TDS is deductible at the time of payment at the rate of 30%. TDS is not deductible where the amount of winning is not more than rupees 10,000. Now where the winnings are wholly in kind or partly in cash and partly in kind but the part in cash is not sufficient to meet TDS liability. For example, uh, the winning is in the nature of say a car a car is being given so it is in kind now how will the TDS be paid in that case the payer should ensure before releasing the winning before that tax has been paid in respect of the winnings and after that the car can be released 194 BB covers winnings from any horse race and who is the payer a bookmaker or a person having license in, having license for horse racing in any race course or for arranging or wagering or betting in any race course and the payee can be any person. In such case the time and rate is the same as that under 194B. TDS is not deductible where the amount of winnings is not more than 10,000 same as 
B. Next is the theme on commission. First section is 194D which deals with insurance commission. The payer can be any person, the payee should be a resident. A specified payment is remuneration or reward as commission or otherwise for soliciting or procuring insurance business. So basically insurance commission. TDS is deductible at the time of earlier of credit or payment. Rate, it is 10% where the payee is a domestic company and 5% in all other cases. A higher rate applies for without PAN or ROI non-filer cases. TDS is not deductible where income credited or paid during the financial year is not more than 15,000. 194G covers lottery commission. Payer can be any person. The payee should be any person who is or has been stocking, distributing, purchasing or selling what? Lottery tickets. So the specified payment is commission, remuneration or price on such lottery tickets. TDS is deductible at the time of earlier of credit or payment at the rate of 5%. Higher rate applies for without PAN or ROI non-filer cases. TDS is not deductible if the amount is not more than 15,000. Next comes 194H, which is the general provision for commission or brokerage. Payer can be any person if it is not an individual or HUF. But if it is an individual or HUF, the payer should be a specified individual or HUF. Okay. Pay needs to be a resident. A specified payment is commission or brokerage. Commission referred in 194D is not covered in 194H. Okay. TDS is deductible at the time of earlier of credit or payment at the rate of 5% and higher rate applies for without PAN or ROI non-filer cases. TDS is not deductible in five situations. TDS is not deductible in the following cases. One, where income credited or paid during the financial year is not more than 15,000. Two, on payment for professional services in case of specified profession under section 44AA. Under section 44AA. This is what we have looked at while covering the topic on PGBP. In such case, TDS is levyable under section 194J, which we will look at in some time. Three, payment in relation to a transaction related to securities. TDS is not deductible. Four, so on commission or brokerage payable by BSNL or MTNL to their PCO, public call office franchisees. Five, payment made by TV channels or newspaper companies. TV channels or newspaper companies may make payments to advertising agency. For what? For booking of advertisement, procuring of advertisement or canvassing for advertisement. In that case, 194H doesn't apply. Why? Because the relation between these parties is that of principal to principal. It is not principal to agent. It is not principal to agent. It is principal to principal. So only principal to agent relationship with result will result in a commission, not principal to principal relationship. So TDS is not deductible. So 194H applies where the payer is an specified individual or HUF. What about a non-specified individual or HUF payer? Such person will be covered not here but under section 194M. We will now cover the theme of work and services. First we will look at section 194C which deals with contract for work. Who should be the payer? A specified person. There is a list of specified persons from serial number 1 to 12. The government whether central or state, local authority, is statutory corporation, company, Cooperative Society, Housing or Town Planning Authority, Registered Society, Trust, University, Government of a Foreign State or a Foreign Enterprise or an Association or Body Established Outside India, Firm and lastly an individual HUF, AOP or BOI which is not covered under 1211 above. Right? But only an individual HUF, AOP or BOI which is specified, which is specified. What about individual or HUA which is non-specified? They are not covered under 194C but under 194M. So the payer needs to be a specified person. Who should be the payee? 
a resident who is a contractor sub contractor is also covered what should be the specified payment sum paid for carrying out any work in pursuance of a contract between the payer and the payee right so sum paid for carrying out any work in pursuance of a contract between the payer and the payee is covered under 194c work includes supply of labor for carrying out any work so works contract as well as a labor contract is covered under 194c contract also includes sub contract so sub contract is also covered now work includes the following 1 2 3 4 5 one advertising two broadcasting and telecasting and this includes production of program for such purpose three carriage of goods or passengers by any mode of transport which is other than by railways so transportation contract four catering and five manufacturing or supplying a product according to the requirement or specification of a customer condition is that the manufacturer or supplier should be by using material purchased from such customer or its associate so manufacturer or supplier and a customer and this person is manufacturing and supplying the product as per the requirement or specification of the customer right and the material which he uses is procured from the customer is procured from the customer or the associate of the customer in such case it will be work liable to tds under 194c okay but if the manufacturer sources the material from his own not from the customer or associate and then supplies then this will not be a work this will be a contract of sale so contract of sale is outside 194c scope what is the time and rate of tds tds is deductible at the time of earlier of credit or payment what is the rate rate is 1% where the payee is individual or huf and 2% in case of others a higher rate applies for without pan or roi non filer cases now tds is not deductible in certain cases tds is not deductible in certain cases number 1 where the sum credited or paid is not more than rupees 30000 but tds is deductible where the aggregate of such sums credited or paid during the financial year is more than rupees 1 lakh what is the effect of this tds is not applicable if the sum is not more than 30000 in a single payment and not more than 1 lakh in the aggregate during the financial year this is the effect number 2 where the payer is the individual or huf tds is not deductible where the sum is credited or paid exclusively for personal purposes of such individual or any member of the hua for example catering contract given for the marriage function number 3 where the sum is credited or paid to the payee who is engaged in a goods carriage business that means during the course of business of plying hiring or leasing goods carriages if two conditions are satisfied one the payee owns not more than 10 goods carriages when at any time during the previous year and second condition the payee furnishes a declaration to that effect with his pan to whom to the payer in that case also tds is not required to be deducted now in the case of work referred in number 5 manufacturing or supplying a product as per requirement or specification of the customer using material supplied by such customer or his associate if the value of the material is mentioned separately in the invoice then tds is to be deducted on the value excluding the value of material if that is not the case then tds is to be deducted on the whole of the invoice value as we noted above where the material is sourced even from the associate of the customer it is treated as a work so what is the scope of the term associate it means a related party as referred under section 40a2 which we have already discussed uh, while covering the topic on pgvp in the case of gas transportation 
where the owner or seller of gas sells as well as transports the gas to the purchaser end user till the point of delivery say g sells as well as transports the gas to p till the point of delivery where the ownership of gas passes from g to p right in such case the question is whether tds is supposed to be deducted on the transportation charges because transportation is covered as work okay but this is contract for sale and therefore tds is not applicable on gas transportation charges but there may be a situation where g hands over the gas to a transporter who then transports the gas to p and p pays transportation charges to t in such case transportation charges paid to a third party will be liable to tds under section 194c because that will be treated not as a contract of sale but as a contract of work what about content production by a production house so content or a program is produced by production house as per the specifications provided by the broadcaster or telecaster say bt so ph is producing the content or program as per specifications provided by bt and as we noted above broadcasting and telecasting c serial number 2 broadcasting and telecasting including production of program for such purpose is included within the definition of work okay so in such case where the copyright is also transferred to the broadcaster or telecaster then that is a contract for work which is liable to tds under 194c so ph is producing content or program as per specifications of bt and the copyright is also transferred to bt that is a contract of work but if the content has already been produced by ph and the broadcaster or the telecaster the bt acquires only the telecasting or broadcasting rights in that case it will not be a contract of work and 194c will not apply but other tds provisions may be explored so it will not be a contract of work advertising agency so as we noted above advertising is also included serial number 1 in the definition of work what about payments made by the client to an advertising agency so that is work liable to tds under 194c <clears throat> what about a cold storage where the cooling charges are paid by customers of cold storage that is a contract of work and that is liable to tds under 194c 194i which covers rent is not applicable because what the customers are paying is not uh, rent they are cooling charges what about out of pocket expenses when the payee issues the bill the bill will also include the amount of actual expenses the bill will include reimbursement for actual expenses so tds should be deducted on what amount tds should be deducted not on the net amount but on the gross amount including such reimbursements for actual expenses why because tds under 194c is to be deducted on the sum paid on the sum paid and therefore the gross amount of the bill is liable for tds so as we noted some time back that tds under 194c applies to works contract or labor contract it does not apply to a contract of sale what about payment for professional services in case of a specified profession under section 44 aa we need to note that that is covered under section 194j but payment for other service contracts can fall under 194c the next provision is section 194j it covers fps fts royalty etc who should be the payer payer should be any person if not an individual or huf as far as individual or huf payer is concerned the individual or huf needs to be a specified individual or huf payee should be a resident what is the sum which is covered under 194j five items any sum by way of fees for professional services or fps fees for technical services or fts remuneration or fees or commission to a director of a company royalty non compete fee referred under section 28 va 28 va recollect our uh, coverage on the topic on pgbp this is taxable as pgbp non compete fees tds is deductible at the time of earlier of credit or payment there is a higher rate for without pan or roi non filer cases TDS is to be deducted at the rate specified below where the sums credited or paid during the financial year does not exceed the threshold for fps rate is 10% threshold is 30000 for fts 
नॉट बींग प्रोफेशनल सर्विसेस रेट इज टू परसेंट बींग प्रोफेशनल सर्विसेज रेट इज टेन परसेंट द कम्बाइंड थ्रेस होल्ड फॉर बोथ दीज केसेज ऑफ एफ टी एस इज थर्टी थाउजेंड डायरेक्टर्स रेम्यूनरेशन और फीस और कमीशन रेट इज टेन परसेंट देर इज नो थ्रेस होल्ड रॉयल्टी इफ इट इज इन द नेचर ऑफ कंसिडरेशन फॉर सेल डिस्ट्रीब्यूशन और एग्जीबिशन ऑफ सिनेमाटोग्राफिक फिल्म रेट इज टू परसेंट इन अदर केसेज रेट इज टेन परसेंट द कम्बाइंड थ्रेस होल्ड फॉर बोथ द केसेज ऑफ रॉयल्टी इज थर्टी थाउजेंड नॉन कॉम्पीट फीस रेट इज टेन परसेंट एंड थ्रेट्स एंड द थ्रेस होल्ड इज थर्टी थाउजेंड वेयर द पेई इज एंगेज ओनली इन द बिजनेस ऑफ ऑपरेशन ऑफ कॉल सेंटर देन द रेट ऑफ टी डी एस इज स्पेशल रेट ऑफ टू परसेंट टी डी एस इज नॉट डिडक्टेबल इन द फॉलोइंग केसेस वन वेयर द सम डज नॉट एक्सीड द थ्रेस होल्ड स्पेसिफाइड अब टू वेयर द पेयर इज एन इंडिविजुअल और एच यू एफ दैट मीन्स द स्पेसिफाइड इंडिविजुअल और एच यू एफ वेयर द सम इज अदर देन बाई वे ऑफ एफ पी एस और एफ टी एस वॉट दिस मीन्स इज दैट एन इंडिविजुअल और एच यू एफ इज लाइबल टू डिडक्ट टी डी एस अंडर वन नाइनटी फोर जे ओनली इन केस ऑफ एफ पी एस और एफ टी एस थ्री वेयर द पेयर इज इंडिविजुअल और एच यू एफ वेयर द सम बाई वे ऑफ एफ पी एस इज क्रेडिटेड और पेड एक्सक्लूसिवली फॉर पर्सनल पर्पजेज ऑफ सच इंडिविजुअल और एनी मेंबर ऑफ द एच यू एफ दिस एग्जामेशन इज ओनली फॉर एफ पी एस इट इज नॉट फॉर एफ टी एस इट इज ओनली फॉर एफ पी एस फोर्थ इन केस ऑफ डायरेक्टर्स रेम्यूनरेशन फीस कमीशन ऑन विच टी डी एस इज डिडक्टेबल अंडर सेक्शन वन नाइनटी टू सो वेयर द डायरेक्टर इज एन एम्प्लॉय एंड द रेम्यूनरेशन फीस कमीशन इज इन द नेचर ऑफ सैलरी टी डी एस विल बी डिडक्टेड अंडर सेक्शन वन नाइनटी टू नॉट अंडर वन नाइनटी फोर जे फिफ्थ वेयर पेमेंट इज बाय अ पर्सन ट्रांसफरी फॉर वॉट एक्विजिशन ऑफ सॉफ्टवेयर फ्रॉम अ रेसिडेंट विच इज द ट्रांसफर सो फॉर एग्जाम्पल बी इज द ट्रांसफर ऑफ सॉफ्टवेयर हु इज द रेसिडेंट एंड सी इज द ट्रांसफरी एंड सी इज एक्वायरिंग अ सॉफ्टवेयर फ्रॉम बी सो सी इज सपोज टू मेक पेमेंट टू बी एंड द क्वेश्चन इज वेदर टी डी एस विल बी डिडक्टेबल अंडर वन नाइनटी फोर जे TDS will not be deducted if certain conditions are satisfied. First, if software is acquired in a subsequent transfer, that means before B transferred the software to C, B had acquired it from A. So transfer from B to C is a subsequent transfer, right? And the transferer has transferred the software subsequent transfer, and the transferer that is B. has transferred the software without any modifications so b acquired the software from a and without modification transferred it to c without any further modification tds was deducted under section 194j or 195 as the case may be for any previous transfer of such software that means when b made payment to a b deducted the amount of tds and finally the transferee that is c obtains a declaration from whom the transferer that is b that tds has been so deducted along with the pan of the transferer that is b in such case c will not need to deduct tds under section 194j professional services now fees for professional services is covered under 194j so what is professional services it is services in the course of carrying on profession referred under 44a recollect our uh, discussion under 44 AA in the topic on pgbp plus advertising plus services rendered by notified persons in relation to sports activities who are these notified persons sports persons umpires and referees coaches and trainers team physicians and physiotherapists event managers commentators anchors and sports columnists what about payments made by tps to the hospitals by tps to the hospitals on behalf of insurance companies for settlement of claims under various schemes including cashless schemes right so patient comes to the hospital hospital is h patient is p for example so hospital renders services to the patient p and p is now supposed to make payment to h but p has an insurance policy within say i okay now i has appointed tpa which is t so p approaches t p approaches t t processes the claim and on behalf of insurance company t makes the payment to hospital so payment uh, so the patient 
doesn't make any payment rather T makes the payment on behalf of insurance company to the hospital in such case TPA will be liable to deduct TDS under section 194J what about payments which are made by advertising agency to their models artists photographers etc that will be covered under 194J what about out of pocket expenses the bill will include reimbursements for actual expenses in such case the same consideration as we discussed for 194C TDS is to be deducted on the gross amount of bill including reimbursement for actual expenses we now cover section 194M which covers payment by individual or HUF not covered under 194C, 194H and 194J so who should be the payer individual or HUF but other than those required to deduct TDS under 194C, 194H or 194J so what this means following individual or HUF is required to deduct TDS under 194M number one a non-specified individual or HUF why because a specified individual or HUF is required to deduct TDS under 194C, 194H or 194J so a non-specified individual or HUF gets covered as a payer under 194M second even though the individual or HUF is a specified individual or HUF is still he may not be required to deduct TDS under 194C or 194J if the sum is credited or paid exclusively for personal purposes of such individual or any member of the HUF recollect 194C or 194J in that case also such payer will uh, come and fall within the purview of 194M okay so in these two cases the individual or HUF is required to deduct TDS under 194M the pay should be a resident what is the sum that is covered under 194M? 1. For carrying out any work, it includes supply of labor for carrying out any work in presence of a contract or subcontract. This corresponds to 194C. 2. By way of commission, not being insurance commission under 194D or brokerage. This corresponds to what? 194H. 3. By way of fees for professional services, FPS. This corresponds to what? 194J okay now note here that under 194j individual is required to deduct tds in respect of fps as well as fts but 194m covers only fts so fts is not covered under 194m tds is to be deducted at the time of earlier of credit or payment at the rate of five percent and a higher rate applies in without pan cases tds is not deductible in the following cases one where the sum credited or paid during the financial year is not more than 50 lakh and two where the individual or HUF payer is required to deduct TDS under 194C, 194H or 194J the meaning of work is the same as that under 194C meaning of commission or brokerage is the same as that under, under section 194H meaning of professional services, FPS it is the same as that in 194J you should note that exemption from TDS in respect of some credited or paid for personal purposes is not available under section 194M. So even in such case TDS is liable to be deducted under 194M. We will now look at TDS in case of hire or transfer of property. Section 194I covers rent. The pair should be any person not being an individual or HUF. If the person is an individual or HUF, that person should be a specified individual or HUF. The pay should be a resident. What is the specified payment that is covered? Rent. That is payment for the use of these eight items. Land, building, land appurtenant to a building, machinery, plant, equipment, furniture or fittings. TDS is to be deducted at the time of earlier of credit or payment at the rate of 2% in the case of machinery, plant or equipment. In other cases, the rate of TDS is 10%. There is a higher rate applicable in without PAN or ROI non-filer cases. TDS is not deductible in the following cases. 1. Where the income which is credited or paid during the financial year is not more than 2.4 lakhs. This is the threshold. 2. On municipal taxes, ground rent, etc. borne by the tenant 
थ्री ऑन रिफंडेबल डिपॉजिट मेड बाई टेनेंट नॉट नॉन रिफंडेबल डिपॉजिट बट रिफंडेबल डिपॉजिट टी डी एस इज नॉट सपोज टू बी डिडक्टेड फोर ऑन कोलिंग चार्जेस पेड बाय कस्टमर्स ऑफ कोल्ड स्टोरेज दिस इज लाइबल टू टी डी एस अंडर वन नाइनटी फोर सी वी हैव डिस्कस दिस वी हैव लुकड एट दिस अंडर सेक्शन वन नाइनटी फोर सी ऑन पेमेंट ऑफ पैसेंजर सर्विस फीस पी एस एफ बाय एन एयरलाइन टू एन एयरलाइन ऑपरेटर In these cases, TDS is not deductible under 194I. What about arrears of rent or advance rent or warehousing charges? TDS is deductible under 194I. What about the case of co-owners where they have definite and ascertainable share? In that case, we need to note that the threshold of 2.4 lakh applies separately to each co-owner. Section 194I B covers rent in case of individual or HUF not covered under Section 194I. So who should be the payer? individual or huf but other than those referred to under section 194i pay should be a resident what is covered rent that is payment for the use of any land or building so rent for land or building only is covered what is the time of tds it is the earlier of credit or payment of rent for the last month of previous year not for all the months but for the last month of the previous year or the last month of tenancy if it is a case of tenancy where the property is vacated during the year then uh, the time of tds is the earlier of credit or payment of rent for the last month of tenancy the rate of tds is 5% and in without pan cases a higher rate of tds applies so when the higher it applies the amount of tds will be higher and it may so be the case that the amount of tds is more than the rent for the last month of the previous year or the last month of tenancy which is the time when the tds has to be deducted so it is provided that the tds in such case where the higher it applies it cannot exceed the rent payable for the last month of the previous year or the last month of the tenancy as the case may be when is tds not deductible where the rent is not more than 50000 for what period for a month or even a part of a month during the previous year now 194 ib applies only in the case of land or building therefore it doesn't apply in the case of machinery plant equipment furniture or fittings which is covered under section 194i that is not covered under 194ib what we need to note is the payer is liable to deduct tds under 194ib only once in a previous year that means last month of the previous year or last month in case of the tenancy where the property is vacated during the previous year but Though the TDS is deductible only once in a previous year, it is to be deducted on the entire rent for the previous year because that is the amount on which TDS is supposed to be deducted. Now we come to Section 194 IA, which covers transfer of immovable property. Payer can be any person. Payee should be a resident. What is covered is the consideration for transfer of any immovable property. That means land or building. the time is earlier of credit or payment and the rate of tds is 1% of the higher of such sum which is the consideration or stamp duty value of the property so tds is not on the consideration necessarily if sdv is more than the consideration then tds is on the sdv not on the consideration higher rate applies in without pan cases tds is not deductible in the following three cases one where the consideration for the transfer of the property and the sdv are both less than 50 lakh so for tds not to apply both the consideration and sdv should be less than 50 lakh if say consideration is 45 lakh but the sdv is 50 lakh this condition it is not satisfied so tds will be at the rate of 1% of higher of 45 or 50 lakh that means 1% of 50 lakh 2 TDS is not deductible on transfer of rural agricultural land in India. We have noted in the chapter uh, in the topic on capital gains that this is not a capital asset, so capital gains is not liable, and that is the reason why TDS also doesn't apply. Three on compulsory acquisition of the property, 194 IA does not apply. In such case, 194 LA applies, which we will look at in some time. Now consideration will. many a times include incidental charges like club membership fees car parking fees or electricity fees or water facility fees maintenance fees advance fees etc all these incidental charges are included in the amount of consideration for the purpose of tds 
194C applies in the case of a joint development agreement. Recollect the topic on capital gain where we discuss the provisions of section 455A. Okay, in the case of joint development agreement, TDS is applicable under 194IC in such case. Payer can be any person, pay should be a resident. And TDS is on the consideration under the agreement referred to under section 455A. The time is earlier of credit or payment and the rate is 10%, a higher rate applies for without PAN or ROI non-filer cases. TDS is not deductible on consideration in kind. So a developer of real estate project is required to deduct TDS from payment made to an individual or HUF on account of transfer of land or building under a specified agreement. This is what we learned in section 45.5a. And the TDS in respect of this consideration is under section 194IC. 194LA deals with compulsory acquisition of land or building. Payer can be any person, pay should be a resident. What is covered is the compensation or consideration on account of compulsory acquisition under any law of what? Of land or building. TDS is to be directed at the time of payment at the rate of 10% and there is a higher rate for without PAN or ROI non-filer cases. TDS is not deductible in the following situations. Where payment during the financial year is not more than 2.5 lakh. This is the threshold. On compulsory acquisition of agricultural land in India. And this may be situated either in a rural area or an urban area. It doesn't matter so long as it is an agricultural land in India. TDS is not deductible under 194LA on its compulsory acquisition. Where payment is in respect of award or agreement which is exempted from income tax. Under which act? There is a special act, Right to Fair Compensation and Transparency in Land Acquisition, Rehabilitation and Resettlement Act 2013. Now when we talk about compensation or consideration here, it includes enhanced compensation or enhanced consideration as well. There is one distinction which we need to note between 194IA and 194LA. So under 194IA, only rural agricultural land in India was excluded there for purposes of TDS. But as far as 194LA is concerned, both rural as well as urban agricultural land in India are excluded. Now when we talk about compulsory acquisition, recollect the topic on capital gain. So you need to keep in mind capital gain computation under section 45.5 which we referred on account of compulsory acquisition of a capital asset. We also saw there as well as in the topic on IFOS that interest on such compensation is taxable under the head IFOS in the previous year of receipt after giving 50% deduction. We now cover the theme of trade and commerce. Section 194 covers e-commerce. The payer should be an e-commerce operator or eco. Pay should be e-commerce participant or ECP who should be a resident in India. What is covered is the amount of sale and or services where the sale of goods or provision of services of ECP is facilitated by a eco through its digital or electronic facility or platform. For example, a seller that is ECP is selling goods through an eco uh, who has a digital or electronic facility or platform, an e-commerce platform, right? For example, Amazon or Flipkart. The time of TDS is earlier of credit or payment and the rate of TDS is 1% of gross amount of such sales and of services. A higher rate applies in case of without PAN or ROI non-filer cases. TDS is not deductible from some credited or paid during the previous year to the account of ECP if three conditions are satisfied. 1. ECP should be an individual or HUF. B. Second. The gross amount of sale and or services referred above that is sale or uh, sale of goods or provision of services which are facilitated uh, by the eco through its e-commerce platform during the previous year should not be more than 5 lakh and thirdly the ECP should furnish his PAN or Aadhaar number to the eco in such case TDS will not be deducted under section 194O by eco now when we talk about provision of services it also includes fees for technical services and fees for professional services as we noted under section 194J. There may be a situation where even though the sale or services 
by the ecp are facilitated by the eco through its e-commerce platform but the payment to the ecp is made directly by the customer ordinarily the customer would pay the eco and then the eco will pay ecp but sometimes the customer may make direct payment to the ecp in that case even such payment will be included in the gross amount and therefore tds will be deducted by the eco on such gross amount which will include such direct payment no tds elsewhere the objective is to prevent double tds on the same amount so following transactions are not liable to tds under any other provision one where TDS has been deducted by the ECO under section 194O, then TDS will not be deducted under any other provision of the Act. 2. Transaction which is not liable to TDS under 194O, and what is that? On account of Rs. 5 lakh threshold exemption. Because if uh, TDS is not supposed to be deducted under section 194O, it should not be indirectly deducted under any other provision as well. What about a case where payment gateway is involved? So, in most of the cases, the payment made by the customer is facilitated by a payment gateway. <clears throat> For example, in this case, here is the e-commerce participant who is selling goods or providing services through e-commerce operator, e-commerce platform, right? And there is a customer who purchases goods from the e-commerce platform and the customer uses the payment gateway to make the payment to the e-commerce operator and then the e-commerce operator makes payment to the e-commerce participant. Now, in this case, the payment is facilitated by the payment gateway. So, both eco and payment gateway may be liable to deduct TDS under 194O because it can be said that the sale of services are being facilitated by both the e-commerce operator as well as the payment gateway. So both parties will be liable to deduct TDS under 194O on the same amount. To avoid difficulty and double deduction of TDS in such cases, the payment gateway will not be required to deduct TDS. Will not be required to deduct TDS if it has been deducted by the main ECO on that transaction. So if the ECO deducts the TDS, then the payment gateway will be exempted from deducting TDS. We need to note that sale or, or purchase of goods is also liable to TDS under section 194Q and TCS under section 206C1H. We will now look at the provisions of 194Q. Now we look at section 194Q purchase of goods. Who should be the payer? Payer should be a buyer. The buyer who is purchasing the goods. But the condition is that the total sales, gross receipts or turnover from the business carried on by him should be more than 10 crore during which financial year? During the financial year immediately preceding the financial year in which purchase of goods is carried out. So the buyer is supposed to deduct TDS but only that buyer whose total sales, gross receipts or turnover from business is greater than 10 crore in the immediately uh, preceding financial year uh, which is preceding the year of purchase of goods who should be the pay the seller and the seller should be a resident what is covered any sum for purchase of any goods of the value or aggregate of such value greater than 50 lakh in any previous year is covered tds is to be deducted at the earlier of credit or payment at the rate of 0.1 percent of such sum with sum, this sum, exceeding 50 lakh. So TDS is not on the entire amount, but on the amount exceeding 50 lakh. A higher it applies for without PAN or ROI non-filer cases. Turnover or receipts from non-business activity is not counted for computing 10 crore threshold because the ten, this 10 crore threshold is uh, for the business which is carried on by the buyer. So turnover or receipts from the non-business activity is not counted. Only the business turnover or business receipts are to be considered. What about the year of incorporation? In that case, the 10 crore threshold in the preceding financial year would not be satisfied because in the preceding financial year, this amount would be zero. So 194Q will not apply to the buyer in the year of incorporation. 
Now 194Q applies in the case of goods. That means it doesn't apply to immovable property because goods do not include immovable property, land and or building as well as services. So 194Q doesn't apply to services also. TDS is not deductible in the following cases. 1. Where the value or aggregate of such value referred above referred above is not more than 50 lakh. 2. In case of a transaction on which TDS is deductible under any provision of the Act. We saw 194O above. So if TDS is deductible under 194O, it will not be deductible under 194Q. 3. In case of a transaction on which TCS is collectible under section 206C but other than a transaction to which 206C1H applies. Now we will see that purchase of goods is covered under section 194Q. Buyer is supposed to deduct TDS. Seller in such case needs to collect TCS under 206C1H. Right? So buyer is 194Q, seller is 206C1H. So if a transaction is covered under 194Q as well as 206C1H. TDS needs to be deducted under section 194Q. 206C1H will not apply. But in other cases, if tax is collectible under other provisions of 206C, then uh, TDS under 194Q will not apply. This is the effect. 4. Where the seller is exempt as a person. Where the seller, that is the payee, is exempt as a person. We are not talking about a source of income being exempt. The seller as a person is exempt from income tax. For example, a person which is exempt under 10, under section 10 or say under any other act like RBI Act, ADB Act, etc. Fifth, where the seller, that is the payee, is the central or state government. Sixth, where the buyer, that is the payer, is the department of government not carrying out any business or commercial activity because then this condition of 10 crore business uh, sales, gross receipts or turnover will not be met. 7. Where the buyer is a person notified by the government. What about GST? Is TDS to be directed on the amount of GST as well? So there can be two situations. TDS can be directed either at the time of the credit to the seller or payment to the seller. If TDS is deducted at the time of credit to the seller and the amount of GST is indicated separately, then TDS is not to be deducted on GST. It is to be deducted without including GST. But if TDS is deducted on payment basis, that means earlier to the credit, because payment is earlier than the credit, then TDS will be deductible on the whole amount without excluding GST. This is equally applicable to non-GST levies like VAT, sales tax, excise duty and CST. What about a case of purchase return? On purchase, TDS would be deducted under 194Q and now there is a purchase return. So if the money is refunded by the seller, then TDS which had been deducted earlier under 194Q may be adjusted against the next purchase against the same seller. Right? So this is how the adjustment can be made. But if the purchase return is replaced by goods, so there is a purchase return and uh, the goods are replaced. So the replacement gets completed and therefore no adjustment is required. What about advance? TDS applies to advance payment as well because TDS is earlier of credit or payment. What we need to notice as far as sale or purchase of goods is concerned, apart from 194Q, as we noted above, TDS applies under 194O as well and TCS under 206C1H as well. 194R <coughs> covers benefit or perquisite with effect from 1st July 2022. The payer can be any person providing any benefit or perquisite. Right? The payer, that is the provider. And the payee, that is the recipient, should be a resident. What is covered is provision to a resident, that means the payee or the recipient of any benefit or perquisite. Whether convertible into money or not is not relevant. But benefit or perquisite should arise from business or the exercise of a profession by such resident, that means the payee. So the payee should be carrying on business or profession and the benefit or perquisite should arise uh, from that business or profession and it should be provided by the payer. Then TDS needs to be directed by the provider or the payer under section 194R before providing such benefit or perquisite at the rate of 10% of the value 
or aggregate thereof of such benefit or perquisite. A higher rate applies in without PAN or ROI non-filer cases. TDS is not deductible in the following cases. Number one, where the value or aggregate of the value of benefit or perquisite provided or likely to be provided during the financial year is not more than 20,000. This is the threshold. Second, where the payer, where the payer, that is the provider, is an individual or HUF who is not a specified individual or HUF. So only those individual or HUF providers are covered under 194R who are specified individual or HUF. Insufficient cash. Now the benefit of perquisite may be provided wholly in kind or partly in cash and partly in kind. And the part in cash may not be sufficient to meet the TDS liability. And TDS is to be deducted before providing such benefit or perquisite. In that case, the payer, that is the provider, should ensure before releasing the benefit or perquisite that tax required to be deducted has been paid. So there are three options basically. One, the payee pays advance tax. Payee means the recipient. The payee pays advance tax and the payer then relies on a declaration along with a copy of advance tax payment challenge. This ensures compliance with the provision. Two, the payer recovers the tax from the payee and pays it to the government as TDS. Or three, the payee doesn't do anything but the payer pays tax from his own pocket. In that case, we need to note that the tax which the payer will pay will also in turn be a benefit or perquisite provided to the payee and therefore TDS will in turn need to be deducted on that amount as well. So the amount of benefit or perquisite will need to be grossed up, will need to be grossed up. For example, if the value of benefit or perquisite provided is 900 and the payer is paying 10% TDS under 194R, then the TDS will not be 10% of 900 which is 90 rupees because such tax will also be a benefit or perquisite on which TDS will need to be deducted under 194R. So this 900 will need to be grossed up into 100 divided by 90 that is 100 minus 10% rate 90. So 1000. So 1000 will become the value on which TDS will need to be deducted at the rate of 10% which is 100 rupees and the result will be 900 which will be then uh, the benefit of perquisite which uh, can be then released by the payer after this 100 rupees has been paid as TDS to the government. <clears throat> Loan settlement. Now sometimes there are cases of one-time loan settlement with the borrowers or there is a waiver of loan which has been granted on reaching settlement with the borrowers by specified entities okay for example banks etc. So in such case that is a benefit or perquisite provided but as a matter of relief it is provided that TDS is not liable to be directed. In such cases TDS is exempt but the borrower should be the specified entities and scheduled banks are also included in that list. How is benefit or perquisite valued for purpose of TDS? There are three situations. Where the provider has purchased benefit or perquisite and then he is providing it to the recipient. For example, mobile is given as a gift. So mobile is being purchased from somewhere else and then being provided to the recipient. In that case, the purchase price will be the value. But if say the provider is the mobile manufacturer, so he manufactures the mobile and then gives it as a benefit or perquisite. In that case, the value for TDS will be the price that it charges to customers for such items. In any other situation, the fair market value of benefit or perquisite will be the value for TDS. GST will not be included in the valuation. So TDS will not apply on the GST component. Social media influencers are there where the companies provide products like car, mobile, outfit, cosmetics, etc. to the social media influencers for various purposes. For example, for creating a YouTube video right unboxing video now in that case where the product is used by the influencer and then returned then there is no benefit or perquisite and there consequently no TDS but if the product is retained by the influencer then there is a benefit or perquisite which is then liable to TDS what about depreciation for example there is a company A which gifts a car to its dealer B it is a benefit or perquisite B uses the car in his business 
Now company A would deduct TDS on gifting of the car under section 194R and then dealer B will include this benefit as income in his return. In such case, the actual cost of the car will be what? Will be the amount of benefit which is included by dealer B as income in his return. Thereafter, dealer B can claim depreciation on the car. What about bonus shares or right shares issued by the company to its shareholders? That is also in the nature of benefit or perquisite. But no TDS needs to be deducted where the company is not a closely held company. That means it is a widely held company. And the bonus shares are issued to all the shareholders or right shares are offered to all the shareholders. In that case, TDS need not be deducted. What about TDS during financial year 22-23? We need to note that 194R comes into effect from 1st of July 2022. So TDS is not supposed to be deducted before 1st of July 2022. But as far as the threshold of 20,000 is concerned, it is for the whole year. That means it is for the whole year, financial year 2022-23 as such. So TDS is to be deducted on benefit or perquisite provided when only on or after 1st of July 2022. But if the value of benefit or perquisite is greater than 20,000, this threshold needs to be met. For what period? For the whole financial year 22-23, including the period up to 30th June 2022 as well. Therefore, benefit or perquisite provided before 1st July is not liable to TDS for the financial year 2022-23. No TDS applies where the recipient does not carry on business or profession because the value of because the benefit of perquisite should arise on account of business or profession. Therefore, there is no TDS if the benefit of perquisite is received in personal capacity, not connected with the business or profession of the recipient. What about benefit of perquisite provided by the employer to the employee? In that case, that is liable for TDS under section 192, not under section 194R. We will now look at certain special cases. First is section 194E. The payer can be any person, but the payee should be a non-resident, not a resident, non-resident sportsman. And this includes an athlete, sportsman or entertainer who is not a citizen of India. So the sportsman or entertainer should both be a non-resident as well as a foreign citizen or be a non-resident sports association or institution. What is the specified payment? In case of a sportsman, income from participation in India in any game or sport. Second, income from advertisement. Third, income from contribution of articles relating to any game or sport in India in newspapers, magazines or journals. As far as entertainer is concerned, what is covered is income from his performance in India. What about non-resident sports association or institution? What is covered? Amount which is guaranteed to be paid or payable to such association or institution in relation to any game or sport played in India. Now when we talk about a game, we need to note section 115 BB under which winnings from games are taxable. And we noted that TDS is deductible in that case under section 194B. So in those cases, 194E will not apply. The time of TDS is earlier of credit or payment and the rate is 20% plus surcharge and HEC at 4%. A higher rate applies in without PAN or ROI non-filer cases. Now the incomes which are covered in 194E is basically taxable under section 115BBA on gross basis. No deduction is allowed at a flat rate of 20% and that's why TDS rate is also 20%. TDS is deductible under 194E and income is ultimately taxable under 115 BBA. We now come to section 194N that covers payment in cash. And this is the case where the payer is a bank or post office while the payee can be any person. So what is the payment that bank or post office is making? Cash payment. That is any sum in cash from one or more accounts maintained by the payee with the payer. So the payee has an account or accounts with the bank or the post office in respect of which the bank or the post office is making a cash payment. Then TDS applies under 194N at the time of such payment. And what is the rate? 
the general rate is 2%. 2% of such sum, where the sum or the aggregate of the sums paid during the previous year is greater than rupees 1 crore. In that case, TDS is 2% on the entire amount which is paid. Okay. But in case of a return of income defaulter, ROI defaulter, there is a lower threshold than rupees 1 crore. Where the sum or aggregate of sums paid during the previous year is more than rupees 20 lakh and up to rupees 1 crore, then TDS is at the rate of 2% of the sum paid, entire sum paid. But if such sum or the aggregate paid during the previous year becomes more than 1 crore, then the rate is 5% on the entire amount that is paid. So a higher rate applies and the lower threshold applies in case of a ROI defaulter as compared to general cases. There is a higher rate in case of without PAN cases as well. TDS is not deductible in the following cases. Where the sum or aggregate of sums paid during the previous year does not exceed the limit which is given in the table above. TDS is not deductible on any payment made to the government or bank or a post office. Three on any payment made to any business correspondent of a bank or on any payment made to any white label ATM operator of a bank. The question is who is the ROI defaulter? So ROI defaulter is a recipient or a payee who has not filed returns of income. For what period? For all of the three assessment years, which assessment years relevant to the three previous years for which the time limit to file return under 139.1, which is what either 31st of July or 31st of October or 30th of November has expired immediately preceding the previous year in which the payment of the sum is made to him. Now threshold of 20 lakh or 1 crore that we looked above is in respect of all the accounts maintained by the payee with the payer. So it is called payer and the payee. It is not per payment or per account. Now, if the threshold exceeds, then TDS is deductible on the entire payment, not on the amount exceeding 20 lakh or 1 crore as the case may be. In the case of ROI defaulter, if the threshold of 1 crore exceeds, then the rate of 5% applies and the rate of 5% applies to the entire payment. Okay, so it is not 2% for more than 20 lakh and up to 1 crore and 5% for more than 1 crore. Next is section 194P which applies to a specified senior citizen. In that case, the payer is the specified bank and the payee is a specified senior citizen. What is a specified bank? A scheduled bank appointed as agents of Reserve Bank of India. Who is a specified senior citizen which is covered under 194P? An individual resident in India who satisfies three conditions. One. He is of age of 75 years or more when at any time during the previous year. Two, he is having pension income and no other income. But there is an exception. That is, he can have interest from any account in the same specified bank in which he is receiving pension income. So the specified senior citizen should be having pension income or he can also have interest income from the same bank maybe from a different branch but should be from the same bank in which he is receiving pension income he should not have any other income and third he should furnish a declaration to the specified bank in such case the bank will compute the total income of the payee for the assessment year after allowing deductions from gross total income under chapter VIA as well as rebate under section 87A and will compute the tax at slab rates applicable surcharge and HEC at the rate of 4% okay and then that will be the amount of TDS which the specified bank will deduct a higher rate applies in without PAN or ROI non-filer cases right in such case since the entire tax on the income of the specified senior citizen is deducted by way of TDS under 194p then the relief is provided that such person is not required to furnish return for such assessment year under section 139. So as we noted uh, in the provisions that we discussed above, a higher rate of TDS applies for without PAN or ROI non-filer cases. Section 206AA applies for without PAN cases. 
and section 206a b applies for roi non filer cases we will first look at section 206 aa this applies to all the tds provisions it is applicable where the payee has not furnished his pan to the payer or he has furnished the pan to the payer but that is invalid or does not belong to the payee in such case a higher rate of tds applies under 206 aa which is higher of regular rate of tds under the respective provision or 20% in case of 194o e-commerce and 194q purchase of goods the rate of tds is higher of regular rate of tds or 5% what about section 206ab it applies to all tds provisions except few sections which is 192 salary 192a epf 194b and bb casual income winnings 194 ia transfer of land and building 194 ib rent of land and building 194 m and 194 n uh, some paid in cash cash payment made by bank or post office in these sections 206 ab is not applicable for all other provisions 206 ab applies 206 ab applies where the payee satisfies the following conditions two conditions one he has not furnished return of income for which year for the assessment year relevant to the previous year immediately preceding the financial year in which tds is required to be deducted okay for which time limit for furnishing return of income under section 139 has expired and the further condition is that the aggregate of what tds deducted and tcs collected so tds deducted plus tcs collected in his case is not less than 50,000 in the set previous year. If that be the case, then the rate of TDS will be the higher of twice the regular rate of TDS as per the respective provision or 5%. What if both sections 206AA and 206AB apply? In that case, the rate of TDS will be the higher of the rates under both the sections. So higher of 206AA rate and higher or 206AB rate will apply. We need to note that the rate of 206AA and 206AB needs to be applied as such. You should not add surcharge or HEC to this rate. Under the various TDS provisions that we have studied so far, we have noted the respective rates of TDS which have been specified in those provisions. So you need to apply that rate as such. You should not add surcharge or HEC to the rate of TDS as specified. But there are certain exceptions. What are those exceptions? One. Under section 192 salary and 194p in the case of a specified senior citizen, the rate is the slab rate plus applicable surcharge and then we need to add HEC at 4% as well. Second, in the case of a non-resident payee, the rate of TDS is supposed to be increased by surcharge at the specified rate plus 4% HEC. For example, in the case of 194e that we saw, non-resident sportsman or entertainer, that needs to be increased by surcharge and 4% HEC. What about GST? Is TDS leviable on the GST component as well? So we need to note that wherever GST on services which is comprised in the amount payable to a resident is indicated separately then TDS is to be deducted on the amount without including such GST that means excluding GST component and this treatment applies to service tax as well. No TDS applies under section 196 where the sum is payable to certain entities one the government two the reserve bank of india three a statutory corporation which is under any law exempt from income tax on its income and fourth the mutual fund tds is income of the payee and therefore it is supposed to be included in the income it is income received by the payee hence the income that is actually received after TDS is supposed to be grossed up and the income gross of TDS is then included in the income of the payee. And the formula is income received multiplied by 100 divided by within brackets 100 minus rate of TDS. So if 7000 rupees is received after 30% TDS under 194B on winning from lottery, then 7000 into 100 divided by 70. 10,000 rupees will be the grossed up income and this 10,000 will be included as income under the head and income from other sources. Under section 199, 
there is a provision to allow the credit of TDS. Why? Because TDS is payment of tax on behalf of the payee and therefore credit is given to the payee in determining his tax liability. Finally, there is a beautiful table that I prepared providing a very compact and condensed summary of various TDS, TDS provisions that we have discussed so far. Since we have discussed all of these provisions already in summary fashion, then we are not going to discuss this table. Once again, you can look at this document and go through this table for super quick refresh and revision of all the TDS provisions. We will now look at procedure for TDS to the extent it is relevant for our exams. Three basic steps are involved and which relate to the duty of the payer. First, payment of TDS. The payer should pay TDS deducted to the credit of the central government. Two, certificate of TDS. The payer should furnish a certificate of TDS to the payee. Third, statement of TDS. The payer should furnish a statement of TDS to the prescribed income tax authority. Now we will look at the due date for payment of TDS. In case where TDS is deducted by a person other than the government, due date is prescribed for TDS under sections other than 194IA, 194IB and 194M and separately in the case of 194IA, IB and M. What is the due date for payment of TDS to the credit of central government? In the case of 194IA, IB and IM, the due date is within 30 days from the end of the month in which TDS is deducted. What about all other sections? It depends on when is the income or the amount credited or paid. If the income or amount is credited or paid in the months of April to February, then the due date is 7 days from the end of the month in which the TDS was deducted. For March, the due date is 30th April. In certain special cases, the AO may permit quarterly payment of TDS deducted but under only four sections 192, 194A, 194D or 194H as follows. For the quarter April to June, the due date is 7th of July. For July to September quarter, it is 7th of October. For October to December quarter, it is 7th of January. For January to March quarter, it is 30th of April. These are the due dates which you can note for payment of TDS to the credit of the government. We will now look at the consequences of default as regards TDS provisions are concerned. 1. SSE in default section 2011. The payer is deemed to be an SSE in default when? In two cases. When the payer does not deduct TDS or 2. After so deducting TDS, the payer fails to pay it to the credit of the central government. Then in that case, the payer is deemed to be an SAC in default in respect of such tax. But there is an exception. If the payer has failed to deduct TDS, the payer will still not be deemed to be an SAC in default if the payee fulfills these three conditions. And you would recollect that we have already made note of these conditions, this provision when discussing the provisions of section 40A IA uh, in the topic on PGVP, the disallowance under 40A IA. So what are the conditions? One, the payee has furnished his return of income under section 139. Second, the payee has taken into account such sum for computing income in such return of income and three, the payee has paid the tax due on the income declared by him in such return of income. Further, additional condition is that the payer has furnished a certificate to this effect from an accountant in the prescribed form. If these conditions are satisfied, then even if the payer has failed to deduct the TDS, the payer will not be deemed to be an SAC in default. So this is an exception to this provision that we discussed. Second implication, interest under section 2011A. Firstly, interest for not deducting the whole or any part of TDS, right? And then when the TDS has been deducted, but there is delay in payment to the credit of the government, then interest will arise for failing to pay TDS after its deduction. So first, interest will arise for not deducting the whole or any part of TDS. And the interest will be levied from point A, which is date on which TDS was deductible, supposed to be deducted. 
to point B that is the date on which the TDS is deducted and the interest will be what the interest will be simple interest at the rate of 1% for every month or part of a month. Now where TDS has been deducted then interest can be levied for failing to pay TDS after its deduction delayed payment and the interest will be from point B which is date on which TDS is deducted to point C which is the date on which TDS is actually paid and the rate will be a higher rate of 1.5% for every month or part of a month. Now we noted the exception above where even if the payer has failed to deduct TDS but he is not deemed to be in an SSE in default if the payee fulfills certain conditions right. In that case how is interest charged oh, from point A to point B from point A which is the date on which TDS was deductible but what is point B till the date of furnishing of return of income by the payee and in that case interest is at the rate of 1% for every month or part of a month. <clears throat> now while calculating interest if there is a fraction of a month it is taken as full month. What about the amount on which interest is to be calculated? It is rounded off to the nearest multiple of rupees 100 and for this purpose any fraction of rupees 100 is supposed to be ignored. Disallowance under section 40A. Recollect section 40A IA that we covered in the topic on PGBP disallowance. So payment on which TDS is not deducted or paid is disallowed under section 40A in computing PGBP income. We also saw there that the disallowance made is reversed subsequently if conditions and exception that we noted above that is where the payee satisfied certain conditions the payee. In that case disallowance is reversed if those conditions are fulfilled. Fourth implication penalty in prosecution they may also be initiated. Fifth is on account of fees under section 234E. And this is for what? For failure to deliver or cause to be delivered a statement of TDS. As we noted above, the payer is supposed to furnish a statement of TDS to the income tax authority. And what is the fee? It is the lower of rupees 200 for every day during which the failure continues or the amount of TDS which is deductible lower of A or B. Now we move to the topic on collection of tax at source or TCS. So we look at what is the section, who is the collector in the collectee. So collector is supposed to collect tax at source from the collectee. What is the specified transaction and the time and rate of TCS and some of the other important points. Section 206C is the relevant section for TCS and we will now look at the provisions one by one. Section 206C1 covers sale of specified goods. Who, who is the collector? Seller. And this includes a specified individual or HUF. So seller is supposed to collect TCS. Who is the seller? Seller means central government, state government, local authority or corporation or authority established by or under an act. A company, firm, cooperative society and it includes a specified individual or HUF. Please note that specified individual or HUF has the same meaning as that we have been discussing in the context of various TTS provisions. So the seller is the collector. Who is the collector? The buyer who obtains a specified goods in any sale. So this provision applies in the case of sale of specified goods okay, by the seller to the buyer. And TCS is to be collected at the earlier of debit or receipt. And there is a higher rate for without PAN or ROI non-filer cases. Now we will look at the specified goods and the rate of TCS. In case of alcoholic liquor for human consumption, 1% rate. Tendu leaves, 5%. Timber obtained under a forest lease or by any other mode, 2.5%. And any other forest produced but not being timber or tendu leaves, 2.5%. Scrap 1% and minerals being coal or lignite or iron ore 1%. These are the specified rates of TDS. TCS is not collectible in the following cases. Number one, in case of a buyer where the buyer is a resident in India and the buyer furnishes a declaration to the seller to the effect that the goods will be utilized for manufacturing, processing or producing articles or things or for purposes of generation of power but not for trading. In that case, TCS will not be collected. Second, in case of a buyer in retail sale of such goods purchased by him for personal consumption. So for example, 
the buyer is purchasing alcoholic liquor for his personal consumption in retail sale tcs will not be collected third if the buyer is a public sector company the central government or a state government in these cases tcs will not be collected section 2061c covers lease or license tcs is to be collected by a licensor or lesser from the licensee or lessee but other than a public sector company and tcs is to be collected in the case of grant of lease or license or contract for use of what parking lot or toll plaza or mine or quarry for purpose of business at the time of earlier or of debit or receipt at the rate of 2% and a higher rate applies for without pan or roi non filer cases tcs is not collectible where the contract license or the lease is for mining and quarrying of what of mineral oil including petroleum and natural gas section 2061 f covers motor vehicles tcs is to be collected by a seller and seller includes a specified individual or huf what is the meaning of seller central government state government local authority corporation or authority established by or under an act company firm cooperative society and includes a specified individual or huf seller is supposed to collect tcs from the buyer who obtains a motor vehicle in any sale by such seller and what is covered a specified transaction receipt of any amount as consideration for sale of a motor vehicle of the value greater than 10 lakh tcs has to be collected at the time of receipt of consideration at the rate of 1% but a higher rate applies for without pan or roi non filer cases tcs is not collectible in the following cases one where the value referred above is not greater than rupees 10 lakh that means value of the motor vehicle is not greater than rupees 10 lakh two tcs is not collectible where the sale of motor vehicle is by manufacturer to the dealer or distributor why because 2061f is meant to cover transactions of retail sale that means sale to the consumer third if the buyer is central government state government local authority or public sector company engaged in business of carrying passengers so in these cases tcs is not collectible what we need to note is tcs is applicable to each sale of motor vehicle right and therefore the threshold of 10 lakh is for each sale it is not applied to the aggregate value of sales during the year so the motor vehicle needs to be of the value of more than rupees 10 lakh whether the motor vehicle is a luxury car or not it doesn't matter the conditions of 26206c 1f as we discussed above need to be satisfied now there may be a transaction of sale of motor vehicle which may not be covered under 206c1f why because either the value will not be more than 10 lakh of the motor vehicle or the sale of motor vehicle could be by the manufacturer to the dealer or distributor in such case if 206c1f doesn't apply then the case may fall under 206c1h we will which we will look after some time so you should keep in mind all the provisions section 206c1g basically covers uh, two components one is remittances out of india and the second is overseas tour program package or otpp first we look at tcs on remittances out of india in such case the authorized dealer is required to collect tcs from the buyer who is the person remitting amount out of india tcs to, is to be collected in respect of the receipt of the amount from the buyer for remittances out of india under what under the liberalized remittance scheme that is lrs of the rbi tcs is to be collected at the time of earlier of debit or receipt and there is a threshold threshold is 7 lakh so tcs is to be collected on the amount or the aggregate of amounts in excess of 7 lakh which is remitted by the buyer in a financial year if this threshold is crossed then tcs is to is to be collected otherwise tcs is not to be collected if this threshold is crossed then the rate of tcs depends on the nature of amount remitted out of india if it is loan from a bank or any other notified financial institution for pursuing education then rate is 0.5% otherwise rate is 5% a higher rate applies for without pan or roi non filer cases tcs is not collectible in certain cases one 
if the amount or aggregate of amounts remitted is less than 7 lakh in a financial year which is the threshold that we looked at and that is other than for purchase of OTPP why because even if the amount is uh, not crossing the threshold of 7 lakh even then if it is for purchase of OTPP then this provision for TCS will apply that we will discuss but if it is less than 7 lakh and it is not for purchase of OTPP then TCS need not be collected second on amount in respect of which TCS has been collected by the seller of OTPP because in that case once again TCS should not be collected on account of remittance third if the buyer is liable to deduct TDS under any other provision and has deducted such TDS then TCS will not be collected fourth if the buyer is the central government state government or local authority then TCS will not be collected we need to note that TCS is on amount exceeding 7 lakh which is remitted by the buyer in a financial year, financial year. It is not on the whole of the remittance. So if the remittance is 8 lakh, TCS is on 1 lakh not on 8 lakh. The second component of 2061G is overseas tour program package. Under this, the seller of OTPP is supposed to collect TCS from the buyer who purchases OTPP upon receipt of any amount from the buyer of an OTPP. TCS is to be collected at earlier of debit or receipt at the rate of 5% and higher rate applies for without PAN or ROI non-filer cases. TCS is not collectible in the following cases. One, where the buyer is liable to deduct TDS under any other provision and has deducted such TDS. So, uh, both TDS and TCS will not apply on the same transaction. Second, if the buyer is central government, state government or local authority. Now the question is what is OTPP overseas tour program package? So it means a tour package. So therefore sale of individual components like uh, hotel or only travel or only sightseeing is not covered. It should be a package. So tour package which offers visit to a foreign country that means a country or territory outside India and this includes what it includes expenses for travel or hotel stay or boarding or lodging or any other expenditure of similar nature or in relation thereto section 206 1h covers sale of goods who is the collector seller whose total sales gross receipts or turnover from business is greater than 10 crore when during the financial year which financial year immediately preceding the financial year in which sale of goods is carried out and TCS is to be collected from buyer who purchases any goods from such seller TCS is in respect of receipt of any amount as consideration for sale of any goods of the value or aggregate of such value greater than 50 lakh in any previous year TCS is at the time of receipt of such amount at the rate of 0.1% of sale consideration exceeding 50 lakh <coughs> exceeding 50 lakh and a higher rate is prescribed for without PAN or ROI non-filer cases. TCS is not applicable in the following cases. 1. Where the value referred above is not more than 50 lakh. In that case TCS is not Collectible. 2. Where goods are being exported out of India. Star means what? In such case, such goods are not considered in computing the threshold of 50 lakh. So, these goods are excluded. The value of these goods is excluded. 3. Where goods are covered under 206C1, 1F or 1G. Okay, and also star. That means the value of such goods is not considered in computing 50 lakh threshold. What is 2061? We saw above sale of specified goods, 1F, sale of motor vehicle, 1G, sale of OTPP. So if TCS is collectible there, if goods are covered there, then TCS will not be uh, will not be collected here under 206C1H. Fourth, if the buyer is liable to deduct TDS under any other provision on goods purchased by him from the seller and has deducted TDS. With section, section 194Q, if the buyer has deducted the TDS under 194Q, TDS, uh, TCS will not be collected under 206C1H. 5. If e-commerce operator has deducted TDS under 194O on sale of goods by seller to the buyer through e-commerce operator, so if 194O has been, has been applied and TDS has been deducted, then TCS will not be collected under 206C1H. 6. If buyer is central government, state government or local authority. 7. 
if buyer is a person importing goods into India, eighth, if seller is a notified person, and lastly, where buyer is exempt as a person, not in respect of just a source of income, but as a person from income tax, say the person is exempt under section 10 or exempt under any other act like RBI Act, etc. Now you need to know 206C1F and 206C1H because a transaction may fall under both these sections. So what should we do in that case? 206C1F applies where? In the case of sale of motor vehicle of value greater than 10 lakh and 206C1H applies where there is sale of any goods of value greater than 50 lakh. So a sale of motor vehicle can get covered under both these provisions. If the receipt of sale consideration is from a dealer, that means motor vehicle is sale by a manufacturer to the dealer, then 206C1F will not get covered because 206C1F gets covered in the transaction of retail sale and consequently it will get covered under 206C1H if the conditions of 206C1H are satisfied. Okay. Second, may be a case where receipt of sale consideration for sale of motor vehicle to a consumer is of value not more than 10 lakh. So it is to a consumer so 206C1F can apply but since the value is not more than 10 lakh then 206C1F will not apply and therefore it can get covered under 206C1H. But for coverage under 206C1H the Receipt of sales consideration for such vehicles during the previous year should be greater than 50 lakh. Third situation could be where the receipt of sale consideration is for sale of motor vehicle to consumer of value greater than 10 lakh. That means 206C1F can apply, right? In that case, it will not be covered by 206C1H. What do you need to further note is 206C1H covers sale of goods and the corresponding a similar section for the TDS was 194Q which covers purchase of goods of value greater than 50 lakh. So let's take a look at a quick comparison. 194Q and 206C1H. Who is the person responsible? 194Q the buyer is required to deduct TDS. 206C1H the seller is required to collect TCS. Total sales, gross receipts or turnover from business in the preceding financial year. 194Q should be greater than 10 crore for the buyer. 206C1H should be greater than 10 crore for the seller. Payment or receipt covered under the provision. 194Q. Sum for purchase of goods of value or aggregate greater than 50 lakh in any previous year. 206C1H. Consideration for sale of goods of value or aggregate greater than 50 lakh in any previous year. What is the time? For 194Q. The TDS is earlier of credit or payment. 206C1H, TCS should be, the time is at the time of receipt of consideration. Rate, 194Q, TDS at the rate of 0.1% of such sum exceeding 50 lakh. In without PAN cases, section 206AA, the rate is 5%. Okay, 206C1H, TCS at the rate of 0.1%, same rate of such consideration exceeding 50 lakh. Without PAN cases covered by section 206CC which we will shortly look at and the rate is 1%. Now in addition to 206C1H and TDS under 194Q also recollect that TDS can be liable under 194O as well if the sale is facilitated by an e-commerce operator. So now on the same transactions three provisions can apply. If 194O and 194Q applies then TDS will be under 194O. If 194O and 206C1H applies, then TDS will be under 194O. If 194Q and 206C1H applies, then TDS will be under 194Q. If all the three provisions apply, then TDS will be under 194O. And if only one of these provisions apply, then TDS or TCS will be under the respective provisions. So in nutshell, what you will note is the first priority is given to 194O, second priority is given to 194Q and third priority is given to 206C1H. This is the position in case of conflict between multiple provisions. 
certain points that we will now note in respect of TCS. Just like TDS, uh, there are provisions in TCS also for a higher rate for without PAN case under section 206 CC and ROI non-filer case under 206 double CA. First we look at 206 CC. When is this applicable? Where the collectee, that means from whom the person needs to collect TCS is the collectee. So the collector needs to collect TCS from the collectee. So where the collectee has not furnished his PAN to the collector or has furnished PAN to the collector but the PAN is invalid or does not belong to the collectee. In that case, the rate of TCS is higher of twice the regular rate as per the respective provision or 5%. In the case of 206C1H, it is higher of twice the regular rate or 1%. Now in case of 206C1H, even if the PAN has not been furnished but if the collectee has furnished his Aadhaar number then 206C will not apply. Now we come to 206CA and this applies and note that this is similar to 206AB in the context of TDS, ROI non-filer case. So the conditions are similar. The first condition, where collectee satisfies the following condition. The first condition, he has not furnished return of income for assessment year relevant to the previous year. Which one? Immediately preceding what? The financial year in which TDS is, re is required to be collected. But that immediately preceding financial year for which the time limit for furnishing return of income under 139.1 has expired. And the second condition is that the aggregate of TDS deducted and TCS collected in this case is not less than rupees 50,000 in the said previous year. If both these conditions are fulfilled, then the rate of TCS is higher of twice the regular rate or 5%. Now, what if both 206 double C and 206 double C A are applicable then similar to TDS that we saw rate of TCS in this case will be the higher of the rates under both sections. So higher of the rate under 206 double C or 206 double C A will apply. Now the TCS rate that is covered under 206 CC and 206 CC A is the rate that is referred here. So you should not add surcharge or HCC at the rate of 4% to this rate. Now as far as the rate of TCS is concerned under the various provisions that we have looked so far, the rates apply as they are mentioned in their respective provisions. So what this means is that you should not add surcharge or HEC to the rate of TCS. However, in the case of a non-resident collectee, the rate of TCS is to be increased by a surcharge at the specified rate and at 4% HEC. Key differences between TDS and TCS that we will now finally note. What is the concept? In case of TDS, tax is deducted at source. For example, if 100 rupees are to be paid and 5% is the rate of TDS, then 95% will be paid after deducting TDS of rupees 5. For TCS, it is tax collected at source. For example, if the amount is 100 rupees and 5% is the TCS rate, then 5 rupees will be collected and consequently a total of 105 rupees will be received after collecting TCS. Who are the parties? The payer deducts TDS from the sum paid to the payee. For TCS, the collector collects TCS from sum received from the collectee. What is the time? For TDS, generally it is earlier of credit or payment. For TCS, it is generally earlier of debit or receipt. In case of no PAN, for TDS, generally the rate is higher of regular rate or 20%. For TCS, generally it is the higher of twice the regular rate or 5%. In ROI non-filer cases, for TDS, the, the rate is higher of twice the regular rate or 5%. For TCS, it is higher of twice the regular rate or 5%. So it, that is the same. We will now look at the provisions of advanced tax. Liability to pay advanced tax. Who is liable to pay advanced tax? If the SSE is a senior citizen who does not have income chargeable under the head PGBP, then advanced tax is not payable by such SSE. In case of any other SSE, there is a threshold of rupees 10,000. So where the amount of advance tax payable by the SSE during the year is less than rupees 10,000, then advance tax is not payable. Else advance tax is payable. So where the amount of advance tax payable during the year is not less than 10,000, that means 10,000 or more, then advance tax becomes payable. What is the meaning of senior citizen? He should be an individual resident in India of age 60 years or more when at any time during the previous year. 
Since advance tax is the tax paid by the SSE in advance, therefore credit is given to the SSE at the time of his regular assessment. What are the installments and due dates for advance tax? Two categories. The first category is for SSE who declares profits and gains under section 44AD or 44ADA. Recollect our discussion in the topic on PGBP. These are presumptive income provisions. 44AD in case of business, 44ADA in case of a profession. There is only one due date and 100% of the advance tax, entire advance tax can be paid on or before 15th March. But for any other SSE, there are four installments for paying advance tax during the course of the year. 15 June. On or before 15 June, amount payable is not less than 15% of advance tax. On or before 15 September. Amount payable is not less than 45% of advance tax minus the amount, if any, paid in the earlier installment. On or before 15 December, not less than 75% of advance tax minus amount, if any, paid in the earlier installments. And lastly, on or before 15th March, 100% of advance tax minus amounts, if any, paid in the earlier installments. So this is how advance tax needs to be paid. What about after 15th March till 31st March? In that case also, if advance tax is paid, it is treated as advance tax paid during that financial year. So advance tax can be paid even after 15th March in that year and that is treated as advance tax paid during that financial year. That means that credit is then given to the SSE in that respect. Interest under Section 234B, which is for what? For default in payment of advance tax is not levied because there is no default. Advance tax has been paid within the year. But interest under 234C is levied. Why? Because it is for deferment of advance tax. So advance tax is paid after 15th of March. So there is deferment. So interest under 234C is levied. Now, advance tax is computed on the current income, which is an estimate. An estimate can change. So, SSE can increase or reduce the amount of advance tax in the remaining installments to align with the changes in his estimate of current income. How to compute advance tax? These are the steps. First, we calculate tax on the current income at the rates in force in the financial year. We reduce the rebate under 87A if available and add surcharge if applicable, adjusted for marginal relief if any and uh, add HEC at the rate of 4%. From the balance, we reduced TDS or, T or TCS, which has been deducted or collected during the financial year from the income which has been taken into account in computing current income. Right? If TDS has not been deducted, if TCS has not been collected, then it is not deducted. TDS deducted or TCS collected is deducted and the balance is the advance tax payable, which is then payable as per the installments and due dates, which we have discussed above. Now, interest is payable under sections 234B and 234C. 234B interest is payable when there is default in payment of advance tax. So the SSE is liable to pay advance tax in a financial year, but he has failed to pay such tax. So there is a default or advance tax paid is less than 90% of SS tax. Then there is a default. So, interest is payable on what? On the shortfall. Shortfall is what? The SS tax. SS tax basically indicates the total tax which should be, which is actually payable by the SSE. So, shortfall is what? SS tax less advance tax paid if any. So, the question is what is the meaning of SS tax? So, it is the tax on total income which is determined when? Upon processing of return under 143.1. So when the return is furnished, the first step is that the return is processed under section 143.1. Okay, so tax on total income which is determined upon processing of return or in case a regular assessment is made, then the uh, tax on total income which is determined under that regular assessment. So that becomes the uh, tax. That becomes the tax on total income. Less we reduce from that what? One, TDS deducted or TCS which is collected on the income which is taken into account in computing such total income. So we deduct TDS and TCS which is deducted or collected. 
द रिलीफ अंडर सेक्शन एटी नाइन एंड ए एम टी क्रेडिट अंडर सेक्शन हंड्रेड एंड फिफ्टीन जे डी दिस इज वॉट इज रिड्यूज एंड वॉट इज द बैलेंस इज एस एस टैक्स विच एक्चुअली मीन्स द टैक्स पेबल बाय द एस एस ई एंड इफ एडवांस टैक्स फॉल शॉर्ट ऑफ दैट देन इंटरेस्ट इज पेबल ऑन दैट सो हाउ डू वी कंप्यूट इंटरेस्ट अंडर टू थर्टी फोर बी सो दिस इज द फाइनेंशियल ईयर इन विच एडवांस टैक्स इज पेबल द रेलिवेंट फाइनेंशियल ईयर सो फ्रॉम फर्स्ट अप्रैल फॉलोइंग दैट फाइनेंशियल ईयर दैट इज पॉइंट ए एंड फ्रॉम पॉइंट ए इंटरेस्ट स्टार्ट बिकमिंग पेबल अंडर टू थर्टी फोर बी एंड इंटरेस्ट इज सिंपल इंटरेस्ट एट द रेट ऑफ वन परसेंट पर मंथ और पार्ट ऑफ अ मंथ ऑन वॉट ऑन द अमाउंट ऑफ शॉर्ट फॉल विच इज वॉट एज बी नोटेड अब एस एस टैक्स माइनस एडवांस टैक्स पेड एंड दिस इज फॉर वॉट ड्यूरेशन इट स्टार्ट फ्रॉम पॉइंट ए विच इज फर्स्ट अप्रैल फॉलोइंग द रेलिवेंट फाइनेंशियल ईयर एंड गोज ऑन टिल पॉइंट सी विच इज द डेट ऑफ डिटर्मिनेशन ऑफ टोटल इनकम आइदर ऑन प्रोसेसिंग ऑफ रिटर्न और द डेट ऑफ रेगुलर असेसमेंट वेयर द रेगुलर असेसमेंट हैज बीन मेड बट बिफोर दिस सेल्फ असेसमेंट टैक्स इज पेबल वॉट इज दैट वेन द एस एस ई फर्निशेज रिटर्न ऑफ इनकम द एस एस ई सपोज टू पे टैक्स अलॉन्ग विद इंटरेस्ट फीस एक्सेट्रा एट द टाइम ऑफ और बिफोर फर्निशिंग सच रिटर्न that is on self assessment basis so it is called self assessment tax now when the self assessment tax is paid interest will also need to be computed and paid under 234b so in that case interest becomes applicable from point a to point b which is the date of payment of tax under 140a which is self assessment tax in that case uh, on what amount is interest computed interest is computed basis the tax on total income as declared in the return that becomes the ss tax for purpose of 234b and then interest is computed from point a to point b fraction of a month is taken as full month and amount on which interest is calculated is rounded off to the nearest multiple of rupees 100 and for this purpose any fraction of rupees 100 is ignored the second interest which is levable in respect of advance tax is under 234c and it is for deferment of advance tax meaning postponement of payment of advance tax so as we noted above there are four due dates in respect of installments of advance tax and accordingly there is an expectation that you should pay advance tax fully as required and if there is a shortfall interest will be levied so interest is levied on shortfall in the payment of advance tax simple interest is payable under 234c right so for example the first uh, installment is as we noted above 15th of june and as we noted above the installments 15% 45% 75% 100% needs to be paid on or before these installments so for first installment 15% of advance tax needs to be paid but for checking the benchmark in terms of how much should you pay for levy of interest what we will check we will check tax due on returned income tax due on returned income now it is not the current income which is the estimate but it is the tax due on returned income and that is what it is the tax chargeable on total income which you now declare in the return okay so for levy of interest we will check what you declared in the return because the expectation is that you should have correctly estimated that for payment of advance tax and accordingly paid it so we will benchmark the amount with reference to the total income declared in the return of course we will reduce it by tds deductible or tcs collectible relief allowed under 89 and amt credit allowed under 115 jd so that becomes the tax due on returned income so on or before 15 june first installment you should have paid 15% of the tax due on returned income as advance tax and whatever you paid we subtract that that becomes the shortfall on which interest is levyable at 1% per month into 3 months right into amount of shortfall but there is a margin which is allowed so 15% needs to be paid right but where advance tax paid up to 15 june is not less than 12% that means it is 12% or more right so even if it is not 15% even then interest is not levied so this is a leeway which is given second installment 15 september 45% of tax due on returned income needs to be paid and then we arrive at the amount of shortfall and the interest is 1% per month into 3 months into shortfall and there is a margin so even if 45% is not paid if what is paid is not less than 36% even then interest is not levied otherwise interest will be levied 
थर्ड इंस्टॉलमेंट इज फिफ्टींथ ऑफ दिसंबर सेवेंटी फाइव परसेंट शुड हैव बीन पेड वी कंप्यूट शॉर्टफॉल एंड इंटरेस्ट बिकम्स वन परसेंट पर मंथ इंटू थ्री मंथ इंटू शॉर्टफॉल एंड द लास्ट इंस्टॉलमेंट इज फिफ्टींथ मार्च हंड्रेड परसेंट शुड बी पेड एंड वी कंप्यूट द शॉर्टफॉल एंड द इंटरेस्ट इज वन परसेंट वी डोंट मल्टीप्लाइड बाई थ्री मंथ इट्स वन परसेंट इंटू अमाउंट ऑफ शॉर्टफॉल नाउ इन अ केस वेयर the ssc has failed to pay advance tax that means no advance tax has been paid whatsoever then the advance tax paid is taken to be zero in the above cases that means this is zero this is zero this is zero and this is taken as zero and accordingly interest is computed now there is a relief because in certain cases it be it becomes very difficult to estimate certain incomes and therefore there is a problem in payment of advance tax so interest under 234c is not chargeable where the shortfall is on account of underestimate or failure to estimate certain categories of incomes and what are these four types one amount of capital gains two winnings from lotteries crossword puzzles etc three business income income under the head pgbp but where the income under this head is arising for the first time that means it is the first year for such business income fourth amount of dividend income not being under 222e 222e is what deemed dividend income on account of loan or advance in these four cases the interest is not chargeable if there is shortfall on account of underestimate or failure to estimate these provided there is a condition the ssc should pay whole of tax payable in respect of such income as part of remaining installments of advance tax or by 31st march of the financial year where no such installments are due that means after 15th march now amount on which interest is to be calculated is rounded off to the nearest multiple of rupees 100 and for this any fraction of rupees 100 is ignored now finally what we need to note is what is the income that we need to refer for various purposes so when we are talking about payment of advance tax computation of advance tax then what is important is the current income when we are talking about interest under 234b it is with reference to tax on the assessed income and when we are talking about interest under 234c it is with reference to tax on returned income this is the distinction which you may want to note